the phrase a man who needs no introduction is usually a cliche but in this case like a lot of cliches there's some truth to it Tom Friedman has been uh, one of the great friends of the Aspen Institute uh, for two generations actually and um, it's also somebody when we look at the moral compass that we try to guide all of our programs uh, there's always Tom Friedman and you know he's the one who's thought it through whether it's uh, the environment, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's American politics and American values. His latest book, uh, his one right before it was That Used to Be Us, which was very prescient, and this one is Thank You for Being Late. I go back to uh, from Beirut to Jerusalem, both uh, the original and then you updated it, but how many books? This is seven. The seventh book. I'm trying to keep up with you, Walter. Yes, right, right. <laughs> Uh, I have help. I, have, I write about other people. Um, let me just start with the uh, title, because uh, it's amusing to me how you came up with that title and the pause button that we need in our lives. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Walter, thank you. for having me. It's always great to be in a dialogue with you and uh, great to be here at Aspen. Um, which we were in Aspen, actually. That's right. but, uh, is there uh, snow there yet? Do we know? Uh, there is, a little okay. bit, yeah. Uh, so the title actually comes from meeting people in Washington, D.C. for breakfast over the years. And um, every once in a while, someone would come 10, 15, 20 minutes late. And um, uh, they say, Tom, I'm really sorry. It's the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework. And um, uh, one day, one of them, Peter Corsell, this was three years ago, uh, showed up late. And um, he did the, I'm really sorry, blah, 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 blah. And I, I spontaneously said to him, actually, Peter, thank you for being late. Uh, because you were late. I've been eavesdropping on their conversation. <laughs> I've been people watching the lobby. Fantastic. And most of all, I just connected two ideas I've been struggling with for a month. So thank you for being late. And people started to get into it. They'd say, well, well, well you're welcome. <laughs> uh, because uh, they understood I was giving them permission to pause, to, to slow down, to reflect. And um, I, I always say that my favorite quote in the, that first chapter is from my friend Dove Seidman, who says, when you press the pause button on a computer, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, it starts. It starts to reflect, to rethink, to reimagine. And the argument of the book is that in this age of accelerations, uh, boy, don't we need to do a lot of that. But the title is also um, uh, a metaphor for a, a deeper theme in the book, um, which came out in, in the research and the writing, Walter. And that is that um, what I walked away from this book believing more than ever is that all the things that are important today are all the things you cannot download. It's all things you have to upload the old-fashioned way, one human being to another. And um, as I did my research, and whether I was going to high-tech companies or um, uh, uh, to you know, the, the, the um, uh, outer reaches of Africa, uh, time and again, uh, the enduring thing that stood out was the importance of human-to-human uh, -human interactions. And, um, uh, a sense of community. Uh, I think my favorite, my favorite quote in the book is from our Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy. He's an amazing guy. Most people never encountered him. And I was talking to him one day about disease. And um, uh, we were talking about what are the most prevalent diseases in America. And um, I said, is it, you know, is it cancer? Is it diabetes? Is it heart disease? Uh, and he said, it's actually none of those. It's isolation. And um, I thought, isn't that interesting? We're living in the most connected age. And the Surgeon General of the United States is telling me that the most prevalent disease in the country is people feeling isolated and disconnected. You know, you're, one of your themes is acceleration. And that's, um, you just mentioned it a bit. But why don't we go back to what happened in 2007? So um, one of the things that, the, the, the broad argument of the book is that, um, 
what is shaping more things in more ways in more places on more days is that we're in the middle of three nonlinear accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. Uh, so Moore's Law, coined by Gordon Moore in 1965, said that the speed and power of microchips will double, first he said every 10 years, then every, every, every one year, and then every two years. Um, now it's closer to two and a half years, never mind. That exponential has actually uh, held up for now 52 years. In fact, if you put Moore's Law on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. And one of the most difficult things for the human mind to grasp is actually the power of an exponential. Because we actually rarely encounter one in our daily life. The only time you really encounter it is when you're merging onto the beltway and you need to go zero to 60 yeah, really right. fast, okay? Um, that's when you actually experience the second derivative, you know, I mean, and uh, in fact, the Intel uh, uh, team, uh, Brian Krasanich one day to just illustrate to people the power of Moore's Law, um, had his engineers take a 1971 VW Beetle and uh, basically on the back of an envelope, try to answer the question, what if this Beetle had improved at the same rate of Moore's Law? And um, on microchips, and he determined, uh, the Intel engineers determined that if it did today, that Beetle would go 300,000 miles an hour it would get two million miles per gallon and it would cost four cents, okay? So that's the power of Moore's Law. Um, the second acceleration is in what I call the market. And the market for me is digital globalization, not your grandfather's globalization. That was containers on ships. That's actually going down. But everything that's now being digitized and therefore globalized, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, MOOCs, PayPal, um, this is really becoming the center of our lives. And, that also, if you put it on a graph, it actually looks like a hockey stick. And the third acceleration is um, a Mother Nature. Uh, and for me, that is climate change, biodiversity loss, and population. If you put them together on a graph, they also look like a hockey stick. So we're actually in the middle of three hockey stick accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, and they're all feeding off each other. More and Moore's law drives more globalization. More globalization drives more climate change and uh, solutions to it. So, the chapter on Moore's Law, um, and I really just stumbled on this, um, begins, there's two chapters, but the first one is called What the Hell Happened in 2007? Um, and because uh, as I started to do my research, um, uh, I, I kept stumbling across the year 2007. So um, uh, the first thing that happened in 2007, Walter knows intimately, because um, in January 2007 in San Francisco, Steve Jobs unveiled the first iPhone. Uh, it was a 2G phone, uh, and began a process by which we put in the hands of every, we're putting in the hands of everyone on the planet uh, a handheld computer connected to the internet. Um, but that was just the beginning, because in 2007, also actually late 2006, um, a company called Facebook uh, opened its platform up to anyone with a registered email address. Uh, so Facebook in 2007 broke out of high schools and universities <coughs> and went global. Uh, in 2006, a company called Twitter, uh, which was started that year, um, uh, in 2007 it split off on its own independent platform and also went global. Uh, in 2007, the most uh, important software uh, company you've never heard of called Hadoop, named after the founder's son's toy elephant, um, uh, launched its first algorithm. And Hadoop basically uh, gave us the free open source version of, uh, of a software that enabled people to string a million computers together uh, so they would work as one, mm -hmm. um, uh, and created the foundation of big data outside of Google. As Doug Cutting, the founder of Hadoop, uh, says, you know, Google really invented all these things. Google lives in the future, he said, and sends us back letters. Um, and uh, uh, in the case of uh, basically big data, the, Google left the breadcrumb path for the open source community. Uh, to reverse engineer what they did, um, and the product was Hadoop. Uh, in the same year of 2007, um, a company called GitHub, now the biggest open source repository for software, uh, opened its doors. Uh, in 2007, a guy named Jeff Bezos launched the world's first ebook called Kindle. In 2007, Google uh, released into the wild a new operating system open source called Android. Uh, in 2007, Google bought an obscure TV company called Google. Uh, in 2007, IBM launched the world's first cognitive computer called Watson. Uh, in 2007, three design students in San Francisco who were attending the design conference decided to rent out their three air mattresses to people who couldn't get hotel rooms. Uh, and they, it worked out so well, they started a company called Airbnb. Um, 
In 2007, Palantir launched its first algorithm. In 2007, Change.org launched its first uh, algorithm. In 2007, hugely important company, VMware, uh, came up with a process to virtualize servers. So they, they basically uh, it vastly expanded the serving the server capacity by uh, virtualizing them with software. And in the same year, AT and T, which uh, Walter uh, knows, uh, was the first uh, service provider for the iPhone. Um, uh, in the first year of the iPhone, uh, Steve Jobs didn't want any apps on it. As our friend John Doerr tried to create an app uh, store, and he wasn't interested in cluttering his phone with that. But a year later, they decided to do that, and it increased the volume on AT&T's network over the next six years by 100,000%. Um, and that started in 2007. And the only way they could basically um, accommodate that capacity was by virtualizing their network. Um, and uh, um, in 2007, I have a graph in the book of the cost of sequencing a human genome. In 2001, it was $100 million. Uh, then it goes down to 10 million very slowly over the next decade. And then it goes straight down. Um, uh, and if you trace your finger to the bottom, the year is 2007. Uh, in 2007, this thing we call the cloud actually began in its current form. And in 2007, Intel, and this was a driver of a lot of this, for the first time went off silicon and introduced non-silicon materials into its transistors to extend the exponential of Moore's law. Uh, it turns out 2007 may be seen in time as one of the greatest technological inflection points uh, since Gutenberg. And we completely missed it because of 2008. Mm -hmm. okay. so, um, <laughs> when the meltdown happened. Uh, uh, before we go on, let me say hi to Alma and Joe Gildenhorn and the, kids. and the rest of the friends and family. But uh, they helped sponsor these. And of course, Michelle Smith, who has sponsored so much from around town. So I want to thank uh, our mm -hmm. friends and sponsors who do this. Uh, everything you just mentioned in 2007, or almost everything, was digital. And that's what's going too damn fast. Everything else seems to be going too damn slow. Um, let's talk about the too damn fast part of the digital. So um, what that did, I think what actually happened in and around 2007, um, Walter, is that uh, you know, my friend Craig Mundy in the book, um, uh, who's my tutor on all things technolo technological, um, argues that if you, if you think of a, your basic computer today, it has five parts. It has the the microprocessor, the Moore's Law chip, it has a storage chip. Um, it has networking, it has software, and it has a sensor. It's a phone, but let's talk about sensing just in general. And I think what happened um, is all of them were in a Moore's Law. And they all meld together um, in, uh, in and around 2007 into this thing we call the cloud. Um, and, and basically what you got, because I, I, I never use the word the cloud in my book, um, because it, it sounds so soft. No. Um, so cuddly, um, so fluffy. Um, sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. I've looked at clouds from. Um, this ain't no cloud. Um, uh, this is what Craig calls a supernova. Uh, it's an incredible release of energy, I think, happened um, in and around that year. And what that energy release did was, was really change four kinds of power. Uh, it changed the power of one. Wow, what one person can do now. We have a president-elect who can sit in his penthouse and, and communicate directly, unfiltered by any other media, to hundreds of millions of people around the world. But what's even scarier, or, or drives the point home even more provocatively, is the head of ISIS can do the same thing from Raqqa province. So the power Wait, one, I, know, I know you have, yeah. want to go on this, but yeah. I want to stop you yeah, right please, there yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. Because we talked about ISIS and Donald Trump. And you don't use Twitter. No, I, I it, yeah. Is Twitter a force for good or bad? Mm -hmm. Will we better off mm -hmm. not having, having had it? Well, I, I mean, I have Twitter followers because the New York Times tweets my column. And yeah. if you come to me uh, yeah. and you have a new book out, Walter, and you want me to tweet it, I'll give it to my secretary and she will tweet all about that. Yeah. Um, but I no, don't. I, you know what I mean? But in more general, yeah, this no, notion of unfiltered social media. Right. Yeah, I don't go there myself um, because um, I like my news uh, um, edited and filtered by um, uh, respected news organizations. And if I learn about the fire or the coup 10 seconds or a minute later, it's OK with me. Um, uh, <laughs> And uh, my life is noisy enough, so I am not on social media at all, because um, uh, I just find it too overwhelming. Um, and, um, and so much of it is anonymous. And you know, I think anything said 
to or about you anonymously in 140 characters is pretty much a sign of the apocalypse. You know, right. so um, uh, that was, so, by the way, I have this theory, which yeah. is sort of you know all the people involved. Yes, that one of the uh, original sins of TCP/IP, yes. the Internet yeah. protocols, was that the packets had address headers yeah. saying where they go, but they didn't encode exactly. origin headers exactly. saying who sent them. And that means the yeah. Russians can be in the Democratic exactly. National Committee servers. It means people can tweet about you with you not yeah. knowing who it is. Yeah, and, it just, and that anonymity has poisoned discourse. I think, I think it's discourse. poisoned, exactly. I think it's really done a lot to poison discourse. And um, so I just stay away from it um, myself. Um, I don't begrudge anyone else, but um, I, I like to, to read the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. And, um, uh, and I'm, I'm just old fashioned, um, but that's, that's how I am. So it's changed the power of one, it's changed the power of machines. Uh, so machines now have all five senses. I mean, that's a difference of degree that's a completely difference of kind. Um, uh, I was at the IBM Watson developer conference last month, and uh, the day before I came, Watson co-wrote a song with Alex the Kid that went to number four on iTunes in 48 hours. Um, so we're seeing machines now do things that are fundamentally different, um, uh, uh, cognitively. I, I always like to say that you know, uh, the world really changed on February 14, 2011, when on all places a game show. Uh, there were three contestants. Um, two were the all-time Jeopardy champions, and, and the third just went by his last name, uh, Mr. Watson. And uh, Mr. Watson passed on the first question. Um, and on the second question, he buzzed in before the two humans. Um, uh, the question was, it's worn on the foot of a horse and used by a dealer in a casino. And in under 2.5 seconds, Watson said in perfect Jeopardy language, what is shoe? Um, and uh, that was the first time you saw a cognitive computer figure out a pun faster than two human beings. <laughs> and uh, the world kind of hasn't been the same since, because um, uh, they've just taken now there uh, so much farther. Um, so it's changed the power of machines. It's changed the power of idea flows. Well, ideas now flow and change, I think, at a rate we've just never seen before, Walter. So Barack Obama, five years ago, said marriage was between a man and a woman. Uh, today, he says, blessedly, that marriage is between any two human beings who love each other, and he's following Ireland in that position. So the, think of the, the Confederate flag over the State House of South Carolina. It's there for I don't know how many years. Um, some terrible person shoots up a black church, and Twitter, Facebook, social media erupt, and bang, it's gone like that. So the power of flows has changed, and lastly, the power of many has changed. Because we now, with these amplified powers, we as a collective are now a force of and in nature, at a rate and volume we've never been before, which is why the new geophysical era is being named for us the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. So these four changes in power, I think, aren't just changing the world. I think they're reshaping it. And you talked about what's, and how do we make sure that we take artificial intelligence and make it sort of intelligent assistance right. for humans? Yes. Well, um, you know, one of the most exciting things, um, so basically what I argue is that these four changes in power have, are reshaping five realms. They're reshaping the workplace, they're reshaping politics, they're reshaping geopolitics, they're reshaping ethics, and they're reshaping the a community. So the first part of the book is about the accelerations and the second part is about um, these reshaping. So uh, my chapter on the workplace, um, as Walter said, is called How We Turn AI Into IA. How do we turn artificial intelligence into intelligent assistance so more people can live at this higher uh, rate of change. And um, you know, the good news, I can tell you, what I found is there's massive social entrepreneurship going on around this, um, uh, uh, this challenge within companies, within communities, um, within the, the uh, social entrepreneurship uh, world. So the example, uh, I give a few examples. One is the, the Human Resources Department of AT&T. Um, so I spent a lot of time with, with, with AT&T in, in, in trying to understand how they dealt with human resources, because 360,000 employees uh, living in a hyper-competitive environment. They compete with T-Mobile and Sprint and Verizon every morning, you know, living right on the edge of the supernova, feeling its heat every day. So their HR policies, in short, um, uh, basically their CEO, Randall Stevenson, begins the year now with a radically transparent speech to the company. Here's where we're going. Here's the businesses we're going to be in. And by the way, here's the skills you're going to need to be an AT&T employee this year. 
Um, then uh, they put everyone on their own in-house LinkedIn system. So they've got Walter Isaacson, Walter Isaacson. Uh, if they've divided, I'm making up this number, you need 10 skill sets to thrive at the AT&T of, of this year. And Walter has seven of them. Then they partnered with Sebastian Thrun from Udacity and created nano degrees for all 10. Um, uh, and then they came to Walter and said, we will give you up to $8,500 a year to take the three courses you're missing. Uh, by the way, they also offer an online master's degree in computer science from Georgia Tech for $6,000. Um, and Walter says, you know, I would really like to uh, take a history course, because I'm a history buff. They'll pay for that, too. Um, if Walter um, says, you know what, uh, I've actually climbed up one too many telephone poles. I really don't want to take these courses. Because the deal is they will pay for those courses, they will provide the courses, but there's one hitch. You have to take them on your own time not on company time. And if Walter says, you know what, let's say I've climbed up too many telephone poles, I don't want to do this, they now have a wonderful severance package for Walter. But Walter won't be working at AT&T. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, their uh, social contract, basically, today with their, where their workers, Walter, is that um, uh, if you take those courses, our commitment to you is we'll give you first shot at the new jobs when they open up. We won't go outside. So the real social contract at AT&T now, which I think is going to come to a neighborhood near you, is you can be a lifelong employee at AT&T, but only if you're a lifelong learner. And if you're not ready to be a lifelong learner, you cannot be a lifelong employee. And that is the new social contract. Um, my example of intelligent, I call it AI into IA, and I break it down into intelligent assistance, A-N-C-E, intelligent assistance, A-N-T-S, and intelligent algorithms. So um, intelligent assistant is, um, uh, I used the uh, uh, Qualcomm, I spent a lot of time with Qualcomm, and, and Erwin Jacobs was an amazing uh, innovator and made the guts of your cell phone, but most people don't know that. And um, uh, uh, Qualcomm has a 64 uh, building uh, campus in San Diego. Um, and a couple years ago, they, put, they took six buildings and they put uh, sensors on everything. Uh, they put a sensor on every faucet, every toilet, every sink, every light, every computer, every HVAC system, every door, every window. They know everything that moves in those buildings. <laughs> then they beamed all that data up to the supernova, and they beam it down to an iPad uh, with a very friendly user interface for their janitors. So they know if Walter leaves his computer on, um, if uh, something breaks, they swipe down, the repair manual is there, who to call, et cetera. They made their uh, janitors into um, maintenance technologists. Uh, and their janitors now uh, sometimes give tours to foreign visitors. So think what that does to the dignity of a maintenance person, the fact that they now have an intelligent assistant to help them live above the line. Uh, intelligent algorithm, the example I use, is the partnership between the College Board and Khan Academy, uh, the online learning platform. So uh, you know, we know, all know the story. Our kids hit uh, 11th grade. They have to take the PSAT exam. Uh, 12th grade, the SAT exam administered by the College Board. Uh, uh, many parents, like we, uh, went out and hired a tutor for $200 an hour uh, to goose our daughter's scores you know, in uh, math and, and English. Don't worry, I know you did it too. You don't have to be embarrassed. And um, uh, a completely rigged game. A completely rigged game. Because if you didn't have the resources to even know that you could do this, um, you were totally behind the eight ball. It was a completely rigged game. So um, uh, what happened was the College Board partnered with Sal Khan of uh, Khan Academy. Uh, two and a half years ago now, I think, and um, they created free SAT and PSAT online prep. So now Walter takes his PSAT in 11th grade, he gets the results back, says, Walter, 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 you did really well in math, uh, but you have a problem with fractions and right angles. Uh, then takes him to a practice site just for fractions and right angles, devoted just to Walter's weakness. Um, uh, if Walter does well, it comes back and says, Walter, have you ever thought of taking uh, AP math? Um, uh, now, Walter may live in a community where no one's ever taken AP math. He may not even know there was AP math, okay? And now uh, he's connected to that. Uh, if he does well, it takes him to another site that has over 180 college scholarships, and then another site uh, where there's a partnership that's been created by the Boys and Girls Clubs of America to create coaching tutors for kids who go through this, all for free. Uh, last year, two million American kids participated in this intelligent algorithm for free PSA and SAT college prep. You didn't know any of this, okay? Mm -hmm. That's because um, uh, uh, we just had a campaign where no one talked about what's actually going on in the workplace. 
Uh, Bernie Sanders' big idea was to tear apart the banks. Uh, Donald Trump's big idea was to tear apart Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton's big idea was to direct you to her website, okay? And, um, uh, but nobody actually knew what was going on. Uh, and by the way, what I've given you are just three examples, and the chapter's full of others, what? of massive innovation going on in our country in this whole pipeline of education to work. Speaking of which, how's Orly? Uh, she's doing great, um, uh, and their, their school's doing great. Yeah. Uh, she works for, my daughter uh, as runs the lower school of, Sal Khan started a, um, uh, actually a lab school at Khan Academy in the basement. My daughter's working there, and really thriving. And Teach yeah. for America, yeah. And yeah. was yeah. a teacher here in Washington. Yeah. Will technology end up in the next 10 years creating more jobs or destroying more jobs? So um, uh, you asked the $64,000 question, not surprisingly, Walter, and it's the question I get most on book tour. Um, and uh, I do think that um, my short history of America, let me start here for the last uh, you know, 70 years or so, is that um, one, of, one of my um, uh, quotes I, I really um, uh, share with people often from the book is from a, a congressman from Minnesota. Um, uh, who talked about um, being a blue collar and white collar worker in Minnesota, where I'm from, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Really the golden era of blue collar and white collar work in America, because you could be a high wage, middle skilled worker. My dad's brother, my uncle, worked as a bank loan officer, and he only had a high school degree. I always remembered that. And um, uh, this congressman said that uh, growing up and being a worker in Minnesota in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you actually needed a plan to fail. You needed a plan to fail because there was so much updraft of blue collar and white collar work as America stood astride the global economy that you needed a plan to fail. Uh, what's new today is you need a plan to succeed. Mm -hmm. And the plan has to be updated every six months. And I think that's part of the stress that's uh, coursing through our, our economy right now. So I think what basically happened, 50s, 60s, and 70s, that was really the golden era of blue collar and white collar work in the sense you could have you get high wages for middle skills for a lot of reasons. It had to do with unions and yeah. where America dominated the global economy. The 80s, 90s, uh, early aughts, uh, globalization and automation really start to set in. Uh, we start to feel it in some blue collar work, uh, some white collar work. But um, we, we carried um, that cohort, um, you know, the lesser educated cohort along by creating a lot of blue collar work with housing, by giving people uh, easy access to credit cards, and by um, easy access to mortgages. So a lot of people stayed in the middle class by writing up the value of their mortgage. Okay. Now think about what happens in 2007, 2008. 2007, suddenly machines and software start devouring white collar and particularly blue collar work at a speed we've never seen before. And in 2008, you lose your mortgage. Mm -hmm. So that cohort got crushed, I think, between that pincer movement of 2007, 2008, and I think that in part explains uh, the Tea Party and how Trump won. The hollowing out of yeah. the middle. But uh, in your book, you describe how, let's take a simple technology, ATM machines yeah. or, or cashiers, let's yeah. say. They come in, you don't need, but now we have more tellers, more, more, bank more tellers. cashiers. This, yeah, this is a great research done by Jim Besson, um, uh, who points out that um, we now have more bank tellers, even in the age of ATMs because the more bank tellers allowed banks to open more branches and then to repurpose the bank um, cashiers to do other things. And so my feeling is that, um, you know, I, I always go back to the point that if horses could have voted, there never would have been cars, okay? So um, if, if, you, um, if, you, if you try to outsmart human innovation, you'll always lose. Mm -hmm. Um, but, I, but I respect that we're at a different pace of change here. Yes, 98% of us once worked in agriculture, and now it's 2%. But the transition was pretty slow, relatively slow. Same from industry to services, even services to knowledge. This is much faster. I, I recognize that. But at the same time, um, I think there's going to be uh, just an explosion of work around, um, I think, human-to-human -human interaction. Um, and uh, I think the best jobs in the future are going to be what I call in the book stempathy jobs. Mm -hmm. Jobs that combine science, technology, and math, science, technology, engineering, and math, and human empathy. Um, you know, in an age when Watson has basically ingested every article ever written on cancer, um, if you're an oncologist, 
your skill then really partly becomes how good of questions you can ask Watson and then how you can take those answers and really apply it to another human being. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot, there's data in the book that shows these empathy jobs are actually the ones that are, their incomes are growing fastest. So we were at Thanksgiving this year with dear friends and, and um, one of their son-in-law was there and he's a consultant in the food industry. And so I just said to him, you know, Daniel, what's new? And he said that he was doing a project, a consulting project uh, for a company. I'm gonna get this wrong and I, I gotta get the exact detail. I think it's called Paint It. Um, uh, it's a company that does paint by number classes for, par for adults in bars. And evidently it's, it's one of the fastest Hello. growing, <laughs> yeah, believe me, it's, um, it's, it's an incredibly fast growing uh, trend in the country. And he was actually asked by the company to research to understand why they're growing so fast. Mm -hmm. I know why they're growing so fast. Because when people are home every day facing yeah. a computer, going to a bar and doing paint by numbers with another group of human beings uh, strikes me as a, a really smart idea. Uh, in other By the words, way, that's the secret sauce of the Aspen Institute. People do like to get together. Exactly. And, and um, I, I totally believe that, Walt, and I think they're going to like to get together even more in the state. Now, if you're running a painted class in that bar, by the end of the day, you probably need a massage. You want to go to a nice restaurant, get a nice cookie, whatever. You'll n I was at a conference in September, and there was someone there who described her job as tagging sharks for Twitter. Well, who in the world knew there was a job tagging sharks for Twitter, okay? Your kid goes off to college, comes home for a semester, mom, dad, I want to tag sharks for Twitter. You couldn't be an ophthalmologist, you have to tag sharks for Twitter. You know what I mean? Um, tagging sharks for Twitter, I mean, you know. You will never see it coming, okay? And the thing to do right now, to me, is the hardest thing of all to do. Stay radically open. Right. Okay, because you'll get the signals first, you'll adapt fastest, you'll feel the heat of change. Educate everybody as much as you can and strengthen your safety nets because the world will be, and trampolines, because the world will be too damn fast right. for some people. The worst thing we could do now um, is to actually put up walls because um, uh, that is not how America became great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you talked about uh, going back to Minnesota, saying you can go home again and you really ought to go home again. So I was just there. Um, you came uh, in from this morning, I right? just came from you Minneapolis this morning. Your jacket, exactly. Minnesota it came, jacket came from the way. airport. It was <laughs> two degrees below zero, so I really felt back home. Yeah. And um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I did an amazing event last night um, that the Target Foundation sponsored with the Northside Achievement Zone, which is a um, uh, built on the Harlem Achievement Zone uh, model of Jeffrey Canada. Um, uh, and uh, I, I was born on the north side of Minneapolis. So. Um, in an interesting community. Yeah, I, uh, uh, well, the story of Minneapolis and St. Louis Park is that um, in, in Minneapolis, the, the, uh, the Jewish community all lived in the north side of Minneapolis. Uh, my parents were born there. The, it, was, it, was, it was basically a ghetto of Jews and blacks, primarily. And um, uh, my parents went to a totally integrated high school, not because anyone integrated, because that was who was there, you know? And um, uh, in the mid-50s, um, uh, the Jews all basically uh, escape uh, to one suburb, um, the only one that didn't have redlining, uh, restrictive covenants, and had enough housing stock, because they all moved together, including my parents and my aunt and uncle, who lived two doors down. Um, and uh, it was called St. Louis Park. And so overnight, a suburb that had been 100% uh, white, Protestant, Catholic, Scandinavian, became 20% Jewish, 80% white, Protestant, Catholic, Scandinavian. So if Sweden and Israel had a baby, it would be St. Louis Park. Right? And, um, uh, Produced uh, a and, few people. Yeah, and, um, and so there was just this explosion, this sort of neurotic Jews shot out of the ghetto, meet these incredibly pluralistic, decent Scandinavians, and you get this incredible explosion. And so I grew up with, or lived in the same suburb with, or went to Hebrew school with the Cohn brothers, Al Frank and Norm Ornstein, Michael Sandel, Sharon Isbin, um, uh, Peggy Ornstein, Alan Wiseman, um, uh, the Hauptman brothers who won the National Book Award, one of them. Uh, and this was not a neighborhood in the Upper West Side of New York. This is a one high school town in, uh, out in Minnesota. So it was a freaky place, and, um, but uh, what it was about was, um, and I tell the story of how we built, you know, we, the, we, the Jews there, we called ourselves the Frozen Chosen, and um, so, um, so we and, uh, yeah, and uh, we and we and these Swedes, um, we all learned to, uh, to, uh, to live together, and it wasn't always easy. 
but I tell the story of how we built an incredibly inclusive community. Um, uh, and um, then I come back, the last chapter, 40 years later. Nice. Now my high school is 50% white, uh, Protestant Catholic, it's 10% Jewish, it's 10% Hispanic, and now it's 30% Somali uh, and African American. So the same high school that was ready to take the Jews uh, 40 years ago took the Somalis, the same community. Uh, now the inclusion challenge is so much uh, more challenging, uh, both racially and religiously. The divides that have to be bridged are much deeper. And I tell the story about how they're doing. Um, and they're doing amazingly well. My high school is, according to the Washington Post, the fifth or sixth rated uh, best high school in the state of Minnesota with a very different demographic. And the point I make uh, about it, Walter, because people say, how is it? Because if you visit St. Louis Park, it is completely indistinguishable from the suburbs around it. There's no moat around it. There's no drawbridge. You know, um, it looks just like everything else. But it's um, uh, what it has, and uh, I always think this is the key to life. It had amazing leaders. Not, not heroic people, but people with the right values who passed those values down one generation to the next. We had amazing civic leaders. And um, uh, what, what, uh, when, I, when I describe um, St. Louis Park and, and Minneapolis today, uh, I always think of something uh, our friend Amory Lovins, a great physicist who helped me with all the biology in this book, uh, likes to say when you ask, when P Amory says when people ask him, are you an optimist or a pessimist, he says always, I'm neither, because uh, they're just two different forms of fatalism. Uh, everything will be great. Everything will be awful. Um, uh, uh, Amory says, uh, I believe in applied hope. And um, I really like uh, that expression, applied hope, because what I see in Minnesota, and I see in many communities, and I know New Orleans, I think, is the same thing. I just happen to know this one. I, I see, um, not that they've solved every problem. They've got huge problems, big challenges. But I am struck at how many people, Walter, want to get caught trying. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people want to apply hope? So if you want to be an optimist about America, stand in your head. Uh, because the country looks, in my view, so much better from the bottom up than from the top down. We may be entering a period where we're, a lot of the things we're going to have to do, and we do it locally. And I think, and I believe that. And that's why, you know, my, my book uh, has a theme song. Um, I uh, uh, thought about if I could buy it. Um, and so you'd open the book, it would play this song like a Hallmark card. Da, 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 da. Plays Happy Birthday. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and it's by Brandy Carlisle. She's a wonderful country folk singer. And um, I, I spoke in Seattle last week, and uh, she was on the same stage the, the night before. And I'm so sorry I didn't get a chance to meet her. But her song is called The Eye, E-Y-E. Uh, -E. uh, and the main refrain is, I wrapped your love around me like a chain, but I never was afraid that it would die. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. And I think that is the song of our time, because I think these three accelerations are like a hurricane. And I think uh, some of our, our, our leaders want to build a wall against the hurricane. And my argument in this book is you have to build an eye, an eye that moves with the storm, draws energy from it, but creates a platform of dynamic stability within it. Uh, that is the healthy community where people can feel connected, protected, and respected. And I think the struggle in American politics for the next four years, if not further, and, and in the West in general, is going to be between the wall people and the eye people. Mm -hmm. and, and my book is a manifesto for the eye people. What a great uh, conclusion Thank to you. our discussion, yeah, but we will now yeah. do a round of applause and open it up and see if you can top my last question and the answer I got. Uh, questions, please. Uh, yes, sir. So Mr. Freeman, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ali Wan. I'm yeah. with the Atlantic Council. Okay. Great. Uh, my name is Ali Wan. I'm with the Atlantic Council. And you paint a very optimistic picture. It's a very uplifting picture of, of the country and innovation in the country. And yet it seems, if you look at the news, if you look at social media, a lot of people think times have never been worse. They paint a very dystopian landscape. So how do you account for the discrepancy between the very real trends you're portraying in the book, that things are getting much better for the country and in the world, and why people seem to think it's the exact opposite? How do you explain that discrepancy? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, I think they're, uh, I, I fully recognize they're dysfunctional communities. You know, um, people are struggling. Towns that have been gutted by, by trade and automation, and there's no question about that. Um, uh, partly because so much has been written about that, I decided to write about, you know, the success stories, because um, I think there are many as well. Um, look, my real answer is I, I think the Republicans created an anger machine um, over the last eight years. I think they created an anger industry uh, to make people feel angry. 
um, and they took it out on Barack Obama. Uh, that's what I think happened. That doesn't mean there aren't people who are hurting, should be angry, or feel bad. Um, but I, I think this was a deliberate strategy to make people angry um, and to not tell them what was going on. But how can you explain the fact that it's happening from Budapest to Absolutely. Brexit yeah. all over um, the world? Well, I, I also think that um, there's no question that, I, I, that's what I began with, I mean, there are objective conditions. I don't want to dispute that at all. You know. Um, but I, I do think they were pl highly politicized. Um, you know, there's no question the world is just too damn fast for some people. Um, and uh, I fully recognize that. Um, and that's why the argument I make in my book is that I think the proper governing unit in the 21st century is no longer going to be the Fed national government. It can't adapt fast enough, and it's too distant. It's not going to be the single family, because that's too frail, and there are too many single parent families. It's going to be the healthy community um, that is close enough to people, adaptive enough, fast enough to change. So I think the political challenge is how we build those, how we reimagine. That's why I say all these realms have to be reimagined. How do we reimagine that? So um, I think you know globally what's happened is that um, uh, you know, for a lot of people, you felt this in Great Britain. Uh, you felt it here. Um, uh, my aunt and uncle lived in a small town in central Minnesota, and so I actually saw this happen you know, there. Um, people go to the grocery store now, and there's someone there who speaks a different language on the countryside. There's a huge number of Somalis now living in central Minnesota uh, because of the turkey industry, um, and they came there for labor. You know. uh, they're also wearing a, a head covering that's not a baseball cap. And it's happened fast for a lot of people. So that, that's sort of unnerving. Um, uh, maybe they go into the restroom. And, and, and uh, I think it's so wonderful that LGBT people have rights now that they weren't able to feel at home. But I can understand also that the shift for some people happened very fast. Uh, then they um, uh, uh, go to um, their workplace, and uh, a robot now sits down next to them and seems to be studying their job. Uh, and so if you think of the two things that anchor people in the world, where they live, their community, and where they work, both have been destabilized for a lot of people very fast. And um, uh, we don't have leaders who are navigating for them, uh, saying, here's what's happening. Um, I, I hear your pain, but rather than just reflect your pain, um, here's how I think we, we need to manage this. Um, I, I worked on this book for three years. Hardest thing I've ever done. I broke my shoulder in the middle of it, on top of it all. Uh, and. Um, it was, it was hard in part because, and I'm sure Walter will, will uh, relate to this, because I was writing about the cutting edge of technology, companies and innovators people had never heard of, and I felt like I had a butterfly net and I was chasing a butterfly. And every time I got close, it moved. So I had to interview Brian Krasanich, the head of Intel, three times over the course of this book. Just say, Brian, Moore's Law, still okay, still yeah. going, you know what, you know what I mean? Um, Doug Cutting, uh, the, head, the founder of Hadoop, I don't know how many, right till the, like the last day I turned in my book. Doug, read this one more time. You know, um, I needed an odometer for the GitHub people because their platform went from 10 million users to 11 million users to 12 million users to 13 million users over the three years that I was writing this. So it's really fast. Um, and, but what, what worries me today is that people are playing with big systems. So uh, I actually learned uh, a great political science lesson from breaking my shoulder. I discovered my shoulders connected to everything. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that it was connected to my breast muscles, my fingers, my lower back, my middle back. Everything hurt, and all I did was break my shoulder. And um, uh, you take apart the EU, you'll discover how many things it's connected to. Right. You take apart NATO, you'll discover how many things it's connected to. You trash TPP, you'll discover how many things it's connected to. So. Um, you know, I had to just struggle during the last three years to learn everything that went in this book and then arbitrage it together into a framework. How much learning was our president-elect doing? How much learning was Hillary able to do? How much learning was Bernie Sanders able to do? For the last year and a half, half my book changed in the last year and a half. And so it's a real problem. If you have leaders who have no idea what AT&T's human resource department is doing, and therefore what government should do to enable, inspire, and encourage that, um, that education to work pipeline, you have a real problem. And so I don't want to suggest in any way this was just political, but I don't want to diminish that it was also political. Right. You and my, I mean? my so, point of interjecting with Ali, and I know yeah, there are other questions, yeah. was not to yeah. diminish the political, yeah. but that when you divide the people into those who like the eye and those who like right. the wall, 
That's true in Manila. It's true Absolutely. in Hungary. That's what I say. It's, it's a world true phenomenon. in yeah, yeah. the Middle East. Yeah. And I think that's become the problem of our time, the modernizers of the people resisting it. And yeah. Yeah, well, just to finish that point, it's that because for so long, um, in so many places, mm. uh, average work returned average or above average right. lifestyle, and it doesn't anymore. Right. Uh, we have lots of questions, so I'll quit asking. I'll quit following up. Hi, uh, Stephen Balkan with the Family Online Safety Institute. Uh, in 2007, we were asked, was it okay to buy my high school or an iPhone? Now we get asked, is it okay for my kindergartner to have an iPhone? Right. We also have tablets for two-year-olds, uh, apps for potty training. Are you hopeful, optimistic well, about where we're going? Late. It's true. There, there's yeah. even a stand What's for the iPad have, yeah. while the kid sits on the potty. Yeah, oh so, my God. Um, that is a sign of the apocalypse. So, <laughs> uh, I don't so know. That, I kind of wish. Uh, well, no does that leave you hopeful, optimistic about how we're bringing our kids up and, and mm. also the educational aspect? Yeah with the way in which technology is, or are you feeling less hopeful about that? So um, it's a wonderful question. Um, uh, you know, my, my uh, daughter, my oldest daughter works for the Khan Lab School, was home for Thanksgiving, and I, I, uh, I you know, like a mini proud parent, I like to brag about my daughter. And so I sat her down to make sure I knew everything that they were doing there, so I was properly bragging, okay? And um, I said, you know, what is the innovation of the Khan Lab School? What is the key innovation you're doing? Um, and uh, she basically said it comes down to one word, ownership. So every kid has a year-long contract with their teacher, a month-long contract, and a weekly contract. Okay, so um, it's all about owning your education. And when you start that in kindergarten, by the time they graduate, you know, in 12th grade, these kids will know one thing. You gotta own your own future. You gotta take responsibility for it. You know, I've said m many times in my column, my, my core, political science belief can be summed up in one sentence. In the history of the world, no one has ever washed a rented car. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I am, I'm a, I, I live by that, okay. In the history of all mankind, no one has ever washed a rented car. No people have ever washed a rented country. No worker has ever washed a rented company, you know, and no kid, you know, when, when a kid owns their education, when a teacher owns their classroom, when ownership is in the room, good things happen. Okay. Yes, sir. No, let me just finish oh, this. I got one more thing. Uh, uh, but you'll get there. But the point is that, um, so blended models of education that use technology, where technology is great, like Khan Academy, but also have the teacher and the one-to-one, -one, they are, I think, the ideal way to go. And if you tip over too much to the technology, I think you really... Uh, you know, it, it's um, you take yourself to places you don't want to go. Let me just share with you two things. One is a um, study I quote in the book. Gallup did a uh, a study. Uh, Twenty five thousand uh, people are out of college for. It's in the book. You can look it up. It's either four or five years. I don't remember. And um, they asked one basic question: Are you happy with the direction of your career? Uh, they took all the people who said yes out and they drilled down. What do they have in common? Three things. First, where they went to college had zero correlation with happiness five years into the workforce. Wichita State, University of Minnesota, Harvard, Yale, okay? May, has zero correlation. Second, all these people, or the majority of them, had said they had had an internship, some hands-on experience in their field of interest. And lastly, they all had had a mentor along the way who had taken an interest in their hopes and dreams. So I don't think you get that off an iPad. And um, I just want to read one paragraph, it's toward the end, because it really sums up my feeling about this human-to-human -human stuff, because the book really is a rebellion against everything you have to download. Um, uh, and it really is in praise of all the old-fashioned stuff. So uh, I said, don't get me wrong, technology has so much to offer to make us more productive, healthier, more learned, and more secure. I'm awed by the intelligent assistance I discovered in researching this book and the potential it has to lift so many people out of poverty and discover talent and make it possible for us to actually fix everything. I'm hardly a technophobe, 
But we will get the best of these technologies only if we don't let them distract us from making these deep human connections, addressing these deep human longings, and inspiring these deep human energies. And whether we do that depends on all that stuff you can't download. The high five from a coach, the praise from a mentor, the hug from a friend, the hand up from a neighbor, the handshake from a rival, the totally unsolicited gesture of kindness from the stranger, the smell of a garden, and not the cold stare of a wall. And for me, everything else is just commentary. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'm Robert Lehrman, and if I represent anyone, it's the befuddled. Um, <clears throat> Tom, my question is. You're welcome to the club. Thank you. <laughs> A month before the election, Leon Wieseltier interviewed Maureen Dowd, mm -hmm. and Maureen Dowd said something that I found unimaginable. She said, the truth doesn't matter anymore. And as you talk to us about learning, values, education, and ownership, we have seen, at least in the political sphere, that the, quote, truth, unquote, doesn't matter, at least not in the way it used to. How can you balance that horrible realization with the feel-good and, I think, valid concerns you're describing about mentoring, education, and ownership? If the truth doesn't matter, where are we? Yeah. Um, well, that uh, um, gets to another chapter in the book. Um, uh, no, seriously, uh, because uh, I said I had five areas we have to reimagine, politics, geopolitics, the workplace, family, and ethics. Uh, and that chapter is called, Is God in Cyberspace? Mm -hmm. And now, what, here's what the chapter is about. It comes from a question I got once asked on book tour um, when I was out selling Lexus and the Olive Tree in 1999. And someone asked me at a, at, a, at a lecture, is God in cyberspace? And I had no answer. So I came home here to Washington, and I called my spiritual teacher. He's a rabbi in Amsterdam. I got to know him at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. His name's Sri Marks, a brilliant Talmudist. He's even married to a Dutch priest, a very interesting character, lives in Amsterdam. I called him in Amsterdam, and I said, Sri, I got a question I'd never had before. Is God in cyberspace? What should I have said? And he said, well, Tom, we have a biblical and post-biblical view of God. Uh, the biblical view of God uh, uh, says he's almighty, and the almighty is almighty. Um, uh, he smites evil and rewards good. Um, and if that's your view of God, he sure isn't in cyberspace, which is full of pornography, gambling, cheating, lying, prevarication, and now we know fake news, okay? So God clearly is not in cyberspace in the biblical sense. Uh, but he said we also have a post-biblical view of God that says God manifests himself by how we behave. So if you want God to be in cyberspace, he said, you have to bring him there by how we behave there. So I actually took his answer. I put it into the paperback edition of Lexus and the Olive Tree where nobody saw it. And I forgot about it uh, for 20 years. Then I'm out working on this book. And I suddenly found myself retelling that story. And I said to myself, finally just sat down and said, why are you retelling that story? And this will get to your question. Because everything's now moving to cyberspace. Everything's, Everything's now moving to cyberspace. That's where we date. That's where we find a spouse. That's where we uh, deal with friends. That's where we do our business. That's where we educate. That's where we communicate, get our news. Everything's moving to a realm where we're all connected, but nobody's in charge. And this election was, to me, the tipping point, where we woke up one day and discovered, holy mackerel, our whole lives have moved to a realm where we're all connected, but nobody's in charge. And so where's the punishment for fake news? Who, who punishes Putin? Our lives have moved to a realm. This to me is the biggest ethical question of the day. Um, where, where now we're doing everything in this place where there are no stoplights, no police, uh, no rules, and no sanction for bad behavior. I can call you any name you, I want. And who, who, who sanctions me? So um, uh, I think this is a huge question, but it's related to an even bigger question. Um, and that is because of these amplifications. So this is a great time to be a maker. You want to make something, you're born at the right time. Okay? But if you want to break something, you are also born at the right time. Oh, this is a fantastic time to be Donald Trump or, you know, and tweeting. It's a great time to be ISIS. ISIS was able to act like a government. Okay? Um, and so uh, we're actually standing, uh, the chapter is about the fact we're now standing at a moral intersection. We have never stood it before as a human species. That in 1945, we entered a world where one country could kill all of us post Hiroshima. If it had to be one country, I'm glad it was ours. I think we're entering a world where one person can kill all of us. And all of us could actually fix everything. 
These same amplified powers are creating a world where one of us can kill all of us, and all of us could actually feed, house, clothe, and educate every person on the planet if we put our mind to it. We have never been at this intersection before where one of us could kill all of us and all of us could fix everything. And what does that mean? It means we've never been more godlike as a species. Mm -hmm. And if we are godlike, we all better have the golden rule. And uh, let me just finish. Um, and uh, I know that sounds incredibly naive. Everybody's gonna have the golden rule. Could there be anything more naive? Well, I'm here to tell you that naivete is the new realism. Because I'll tell you what's really naive, thinking we're gonna be okay if everybody doesn't get the golden rule. So I hate follow-up questions. Go ahead. But I do have to ask. I don't, I, I don't like this conclusion, but even with what you said, yeah. from where I'm sitting, at least in the near term, right. ethics appears to be for losers. Mm -hmm. And that's not my value, but that's what we've seen in right. real politics. Yeah. Let me move on to the question it's, it's we a, could it's, in the way it's, back It's, it's worth pursuing, but I think you're raising a, a very important point. I'm trying to wrestle with it in this way, uh, it's, but it's a, it's a legitimate point. <coughs> Barry Strouch, a physician. A, About 40 plus years ago, a book was written, I think it was called Future Shock. Mm -hmm. Alvin Toffler right, wrote yeah. it, and it's dramatically <coughs> like your book uh -huh. in terms of the 40 years before that. Huh, interesting. I, I've not, I haven't read it in a long, I've probably read it when it came out, but I haven't read it in a long time. You talk about Toffler's Future Shock. Yeah. It in here. Future Shock. And yeah. the question is, where are we going to be 20 or 30 years from now, not even 40 years? And the whole point of that book was how everything was speeding up. The amount of information accumulated over the 20 years before then was like everything for the 200 years before right. that. Aren't we just continuing? Um, you know, I, I have no idea. Um, uh, it's a very legitimate question. I just really tried to, uh, I keep a very narrow time horizon. I mean, I, I'm very humbled. I, I think what happened in the early 21st century was something uh, that's a difference of degree, that's a difference in kind. We had two price collapses that really changed things <clears throat> profoundly. Um, uh, the first was a collapse in the price of fiber optic cable. Uh, and it happened because of the dot-com boom, bubble, and bust. So we overbuilt and, and uh, laid so much fiber optic cable around the world that uh, we accidentally shrunk the world. <laughs> Honey, I didn't mean to, but I accidentally shrunk, shrunk the, the world. world, okay? And we discovered that in the year 2000 because we needed, because of Y2K, we needed to leverage hundreds of thousands of engineers to remediate everybody's computer. And we suddenly found that we could connect with engineers in India as if they were in our own back room. So I came along and I wrote a book about that at the time and I said the world is flat. Just to describe that sense of connectivity becoming fast, free, easy for you and ubiquitous. Um, I did a two point, uh, uh, that book came out in 2005, I did a 2.0 in 2006, I did a 3.0 in 2007. And then I stopped, thought I had it figured out. <laughs> As my broker said to me, 2007 was a bad year to stop sniffing glue. Okay? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Uh, I stopped exactly when the thing took, there was another price collapse, which I couldn't see because I wasn't looking for it. And that price collapse was in the, pow in the uh, power of compute and storage. What happened as a result of 2007 is we could suddenly store exponentially more data because of the ability to string these computers together and with, in combination with software, a search for unstructured data and, and use all, and the price for it just collapsed. Those two price collapses came together. The first one made connectivity fast, free, easy for you, and ubiquitous, and the second one, so suddenly you could touch people who never touched you and be touched by people who never touched you, mm -hmm. and the second one was all about what you could now do with one touch. So the second one made complexity fast, free, easy for you, and invisible. Think of what it was to go down here at one DuPont Circle and call a cab just five years ago, taxi, taxi. Oh no, it's raining, 30 minutes, and you didn't believe it was 30 minutes and neither did they, okay? Now you go to your Uber app and with one touch, you can page a taxi, direct the taxi, pay the taxi, and rate the taxi. So we've abstracted all of that complexity because of the price collapse of compute and storage. Those two things together, I think we're, we're quite, uh, uh, I think we'll see in time where a huge release of energy. 
You know, I always remind people, someone was alive when Gutenberg invented the printing press. I don't know if this is the moment or not, but all I know is when he did, there was some monk that said to some priest, now that is really cool, okay? Okay, I, I don't have to write these Bibles out longhand. I can just stamp them out, you know? Um, I don't know, but we may be at that kind of a moment right now. To end, I will tell you the story of the yeah. man who was born the year Gutenberg opened his print shop. Huh. Leonardo da Vinci, 1452, born yeah. the year Gutenberg starts printing. And Leonardo da Vinci doesn't, he doesn't go to school, just learns a little on his own, doesn't speak Latin. But suddenly, there's just hundreds of books hmm. that are popping up in Florence because there are print shops there. And uh, it starts the Renaissance. So That's... things things can move fast yeah. even in previous centuries, yes, but they're moving fast now. I really want to thank Tom. I know there are more questions, but he's going to be out there mm -hmm. Sign signing books, books thank answering you. your questions. Thank you, thank you Tom. Thank you. That was great. I love that Leonardo.